Thanks a lot for coming on such a cold day, and it's even snowing a little bit. It's a little uncertain. Uh, and I thought we would have this somewhat uh, more intimate group. And that's good in many ways because we have uh, a number of speakers today. And we have, we're going to be talking about architecture and space. And so um, this is a very special uh, presentation. In, we had an I-70 corridor conference in November. One of the things that uh, the conferees noticed is that there were very few architects seemed to go to aging conferences, but there were a few at that conference, and it was very exciting because the architecture has been kind of the stepchild of gerontology, hasn't really been paid much attention to. We still have nursing home architecture. We know what that means. Everybody understands that, which is not what anybody wants at this point in our history. And so the question is, do we have young minds and courageous professors who are willing to take on a problem that is monumental, really monumental. I'm not kidding. You can use the word awesome here without just BSing, right? It's an awesome problem, aging, uh, in our society and in the world. And it is, we are only going to get older and older and older. If you think that the number of people going down who are going to get older will be going down after the boomer generation is gone, not true. And the Y generation, your generation, is even probably bigger than the boomer generation. And believe it or not, you'll someday get as old as I am. <laughs> it's unbelievable. Uh, even to me, 70 tomorrow, uh, in June. So suddenly, it's here. And uh, I'm glad that you're here, particularly from K-State. <clears throat> Um, before I introduce you, though, I want to show you where you will be after uh, this is done. And you will be on our website under Aging Education. The website is newcities.ku.edu. Under Aging Education, we have many of the Boomer, Boomer Futures Think Tank programs videoed, and they're there. So you... Uh, would be under 2014, but I think you're the first under 2014. So here's just an example of the ones at, in 2013. These are all videoed, and you could uh, pick and choose. Here's another K-State graduate. You know him, Victor Renier. You can pick and choose uh, from about 25 to 30 of these now in, in your classes if you want to. So... Uh, I just wanted to make sure that everyone knew that um, we're not throwing, I don't know if I did the right thing, but you can get back to it. We're not throwing away what you're doing. In fact, we are continuing to use it. So I want to welcome everyone here today at an, the first Boomer Futures Think Tank of 2014. And we're very, very happy to have Professor Susanna Sippel Coates from Kansas State University and her graduate students mm -hmm. in six. Architecture, Architecture eight. seven and eight. eight seven now. And it's now eight. She has now a two-semester sequence in which I believe, Susanna, you focus at least on this intergenerational community design. Yes. How is it that we can get a professor in, in the United States, in this part of the country, to do that? Because it's not very sexy, <coughs> usually. People say, oh, I don't want to do it. You know, I want to do uh, something else, but not nursing home architecture. Well, of course, it's the sexiest thing going because it's the biggest need, and we can't have the old kind of architecture. But one of the reasons we can find someone like her is because she is European, and they have been dealing with community design for decades. She received her undergraduate degree in architecture from the University of Hanover, I believe, in the 80s, I believe, and then <laughs> something like that. The late 70s. Really. The late 70s. And then she got a master's degree at the University of California, Berkeley, in architecture too, right? So since 1984, she's been teaching at Kansas State University. And uh, because of our mutual interests, I've been getting her over here with her students as often as I can. And I would continue to do that because uh, the work that you're doing 
is very, very important to the future of the United States and to the world. You obviously already have some new formal ideas. They had a nice exhibition last week in Marvin Hall. People looked at it. They took your book away, even though they weren't supposed to, and brought it back. <laughs> you know, those sorts of things. So uh, I know that, Susanna, you will introduce your students, and um, they're going to do this presentation for about an hour, and then we'll have a discussion. So thanks a lot for coming on a cold day all the way from the Little Apple. Yes. Uh, and um, we always appreciate your coming. Susanna. Thank you very much, Dennis, and thank you for your very kind introduction and also for your very gracious hospitality now on many occasions, so I really appreciate that. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> it helps. Um, so yeah, I want to share a little bit about the work that my students and I have been doing this academic year. We started in August, and it will take us through May. And by the way, in May, these students need jobs, just so you know. <laughs> um, as Dennis mentioned, it's a fifth year graduate level uh, studio. And the reason for picking this is partly, of course, what Dennis addressed, but really it's also because I'm getting to be an age where I have started to wonder where I might want to grow old. And I've looked at options in Manhattan and in other places, and none of them were very enticing to me. So um, in my travels in Europe, I did see some other models, and I found them um, quite intriguing. And so I've brought um, this idea of intergenerational living uh, to my class. Um, last year, I had the opportunity to work with our um, department's uh, Rainier Distinguished Chair, which was an architect from um, Zurich, Switzerland, Beat Kempfen. And that was the first time that I actually looked at intergenerational living. And the projects that you see here in model form as well as in drawing form on the wall there and on the table uh, come out of that studio. Um, so the class at that time went over to Zurich uh, and actually studied some of these uh, existing um, housing developments in, in Switzerland. This year, um, I picked a site for the students in Seattle. And uh, you see some images here, uh, for those of you who know Seattle. The site is located in the Pioneer Square neighborhood. Uh, it's sort of between uh, the area where the stadia are and the downtown area. You see a close-up here that's right next to uh, Occidental Park, and currently our site is a parking lot. And the nice thing is that um, it's in a very vibrant downtown district, um, which I picked uh, for a number of reasons. I wanted a setting um, that is urban, where there is um, walkable access to public transportation, as well as to a number of different um, amenities. So rather than building a facility or thinking about a facility somewhere outside of town, I felt that it's very important to already have a context within which life would be fun. So the question still is, um, what would such a facility look like in this country? So we have looked at some precedent in Europe, but um, some of the ideas I think are transferable, not necessarily all of them, and I leave that up for discussion perhaps later on what that might mean. Also in this neighborhood, um, we have a very nice um, architectural context. Um, of course, the park with its trees, it's a very urban park, hard surface urban park. Uh, is very attractive in and of itself, and then the surrounding neighborhood, which is actually the oldest neighborhood uh, in, in Seattle, um, has structures from sort of the late 1800s that are um, some stone, uh, <clears throat> many of them brick structures, with lots of wonderful architectural ornaments, so it's a very rich uh, setting uh, for us to work in. Down here. It's quite a dead. That one. That's why the 
Um, whenever I've taught um, a graduate level architecture studio in the recent years, um, they have always been taught under the larger theme of um, architecture and health. So this quote that is there, healing and place are inseparable by uh, Wilbert Gessler, I very much uh, agree with. And I think it's a very old idea. I know it's an old idea that got lost uh, in between. And I think that we have to come back to this notion that there is a relationship between the built environment, the designed environment, and human well-being. And of course, health or healing is interpreted by Gessler and by me as meaning much more than just physical health, which maybe we sort of tend to think about, but to include emotional well-being, uh, psychosocial well-being, spiritual well-being. So it's a much broader interpretation. So all the projects, including intergenerational housing or living, uh, take that as a foundational idea that that the outcomes, the proposals, uh, should somehow contribute to increase the well-being of the presumed inhabitants. And at the same time, um, what I tend to do is that I get students in touch with, of course, precedent, but also with the literature related to um, qualities of the built environment and how they impact human well-being. Uh, and this might be research papers from cultural geography, kinesiology, medicine, planning, you name it. But it's research that is not necessarily coming out of architecture, but has the potential for an architectural impact. And I'm asking students to take this information, which initially probably looks rather strange to them, and what are they supposed to do with this? And I say, well, if you really think about it, there's probably some architectural implication, and I want you to find out what that might be, and then show me what that could look like. And so the bigger notion really is that by studying uh, specific settings in this way, I hope to contribute, with my students' help, to professional knowledge and to inform the possibilities of creating new building types. For example, intergenerational living, which we don't very know very much about at this point in time. Got the right one this time. <laughs> so, um, of course, we traveled to Seattle and studied the site. We also looked at precedent. And um, since we could not go to Europe this time around, unfortunately, we looked at two books primarily. Um, housing for People of All Ages and Living for the Elderly, which are European publications from Berghauser. And they have a great number of very nice um, documentations of uh, buildings in Switzerland, Austria, and Germany, by and large. And we picked several of, of these um, projects and studied them. And out of that study, the students discovered uh, a number of design guidelines that we felt are maybe applicable to all built environments, but certainly uh, to environments for people that we imagine would live in intergenerational living. And so what I would like to do now is go through some of these, these case studies that come from uh, the book, the, the books, and uh, highlight some of these design guidelines. and. Some of the students from my class will speak um, afterwards about their particular area of research that they've engaged in and what they've found and how that might impact their projects. So the first project is a um, residential complex. I don't think it's necessarily called intergenerational living, but it is clearly intended for people of different backgrounds, different age groups. Uh, and it won an award from the Age Foundation in, in Switzerland. And if you're not familiar with that foundation, you might want to check it out and do some very interesting research. And they give away awards, um, of course. So this is a project that consists of five um, 
separate urban villas, perhaps, of uh, four stories, I think. A total of 75 units, uh, and it includes a kindergarten as well as a place for older people to live, and they are in these two structures, so they're closely related probably with the idea that these two populations might have something in common and could possibly support each other. Um, one of the principles, design principles, is that the units should be easily adaptable. And I think that one can see that fairly easily in this floor plan. It's a typical residential floor plan in many ways. And Basically, there are few, uh, four units arranged around a central uh, vertical circulation realm. And there's a very clear um, structural system in place where around the core, we have all the bathrooms and so forth, so that's fixed. Well, everything is really fixed. <laughs> but one can easily take out one small wall that exists between two apartments, and immediately you can change very easily what these, the size of the apartment. And so in this particular instance, we have uh, two separate apartments, and actually this element, this, this unit here, am I on the right page? Yes, I am, uh, is a, an apartment for persons with dementia for six people. So maybe as sort of not completely, um, but it's sort of related to the larger topic. Rather than sending people with dementia into large institutions where they can easily get lost, here the idea is to keep them in residential settings that are quite small, just six people. And it's in essence two apartments that still have a, a kitchen, dining, and then a large living room so they can be there and um, find the kind of support that they need. So um, here, again, is an image of what that might look like. And Dennis, you refer to sort of nursing home character. And obviously, that is not what I would consider sort of a typical nursing home, at least in this part. And so here, again, is uh, this notion of, of a um, dementia unit. Also, the idea of bringing the world into the building, which is actually an idea that uh, Suzanne Stadler mentioned when she uh, presented a little while ago, this notion that uh, rather than always assuming that we have to go out and do something that we can also bring attractions in, and in this case, a kindergarten, for two spaces related to one another for children that live in this complex, as well as for children that live in the community surrounding it. Another project that I actually visited when I was in Zurich um, last year is Craftwork 2, um, which is uh, on the outskirts of Zurich, located here along a very busy street. And it's uh, kind of an adaptive reuse. It was a, um, an institution for uh, children that had uh, been abandoned by their parents. And there were two building blocks that were identical, like here and here. And it was up for sale, and so a housing association bought it and uh, had an architect um, add a middle element into it. And now it's a kind of very uh, forward-looking uh, model for intergenerational housing. Um, it's, uh, it has units of different sizes and qualities and characters. And it also includes a number of communal uh, spaces on the ground floor. What I want to focus on is this notion of community at various scales, and in this case, uh, cluster living or cluster housing, which is an idea that comes, I think, out of Zurich, out of this project. And it looks at um, a very large apartment here which you enter from the central stair. And there are a number of shared spaces, more private ones perhaps, and then more public ones, sort of a living room, dining, kitchen, bathroom, and a study area. And in what used to be the old uh, individual rooms for children, 
they were now adapted to become small um, suites of different sorts. And they were, they're kind of minimized. So we have a suite here of three spaces. In this case, a bedroom, a kind of study, living room, perhaps dining. All of the units, all of the suites have a very small kitchen and a very small bathroom so that it is possible for the individual or a couple to withdraw and to do you know, some cooking on their own. But the idea really is that people come out and on occasion then share cooking, eating, living in, in the shared spaces. And as you can see, maybe there is this, this other blue area is actually a very small unit and is a very small unit and another larger unit. And so that's stacked on, I think, six floors. So you see this again, but um, I put this image in because it shows uh, an exterior stair and circulation uh, with terraces. And so this is uh, a very important element, a kind of social space that people choose to walk through because it's more convenient perhaps than using the uh, interior uh, stairs. And um, they occupy these spaces as um, belonging sort of to them, but it's shared. So it's uh, a way for people to meet and to be together and in, um, get to know each other. This project is um, intended really for uh, senior citizens, but I put it in here because it looks at senior living in a somewhat different way perhaps than what we know. Um, the units, uh, which are from one to three rooms, are also quite minimized. They're very small, but they are laid out in such a way that they are quite generous spatially. Um, and it's a kind of a service house. So on the ground floor, there is, again, this notion of bringing the world into the building. Um, it's along a busy street, too, in Zurich. And there's, of course, a kind of lobby space. And on one side, the fire room place, which is an image of which you see here. Uh, on the other side is a cafe that can also move partly to the outside, <coughs> kitchen, and in the back in the more private area is a restaurant. And of course these spaces are available for the residents uh, to go to if they don't want to cook or they want uh, company. But it's also possible for people who live around in the, in the neighborhood to come and uh, use them. And I will talk about the apartments themselves in the next slide. So here I want to focus on this idea that um, large, in particular older generations probably need as much physical uh, activity as they can get in a non-threatening kind of way. So in an apartment, what we typically can do <coughs> is walk back and forth, which is not very exciting. So here it's possible in the corridors to actually walk a circular path and to not have to turn around 180 degrees and just walk back and forth. And I think that's a rather important principle. Also, along the path, there are some areas where one can linger, look out the window, see what happens in the street, possibly meet somebody else who comes by and sit for a moment. And there, in this, these units, uh, in the two and three room apartments, it's also possible to walk in a circular pattern even though these are such small units. So in the diagrams, you can see that, I hope, from a distance. But um, so in the three-room apartment, you enter into a, um, an entree, and then it is possible to walk around here, or in the outdoor space, which is a, it's a glazed loggia. So it actually can be closed, and it's a non-conditioned but somewhat protected space. Uh, when these doors are open, one can even walk a figure eight. And the similar thing is true here in the two-room unit where people can actually walk in this way. And then on the top floor is an elder care facility. It's broken into two groups, one over here and here. And again, there is, of course, circulation spaces and social spaces at the center where uh, 
there's this dining as well as a more um, relaxed kind of opportunity for sitting as well as uh, an outdoor uh, deck. So these units are set back a little bit from the edge. So there is actually, when they look out the windows, they have the potential to look at a little bit of green space on the uh, roof. And a project from Switzerland, which is intended, it's called Community House 50, which means uh, people 50 and above is the idea, um, which uh, is quite small, has only 16 units. But here, again, the idea is that the units are relatively small and that the circulation space, the floors, the corridors, are expanded to actually uh, make it possible for um, certain kinds of community spaces to be. So this is the ground floor. You come in and there's a kitchen, dining area. There's also a fireplace. And there's also a guest room that can be rented or made available to people who live in this building. And on the second floor up, um, a few more apartments and an area uh, that's called the library and even in a place maybe where one can quietly sit. Um, the units are all a little bit different, which I find interesting so that one doesn't already know what to expect coming in. And each unit has, even though it's minimal, but has a little bit of a balcony to it. So each one has somewhat of an outdoor space, so this notion of access to nature. And just the other floors on the Next floor up is a fitness area and a music space, piano. And on the top floor, again, uh, a larger area, um, which in this case is intended as a computer desk, a quiet area, and a small kitchen and place to eat for smaller groups. So here are uh, images of my students. And um, they will now take over and talk a little bit about how the idea of healing, what that might mean to them for this kind of a project and what they have found and how what they found has impacted and is impacting the design projects that they're currently engaged in. So, first. Yeah. Okay. Um, my name is Ian Kilpatrick. And, um, for my focus in regards to intergenerational living, I'm looking at a concept called open building, um, really looking at adaptable spaces and architecture. When we started this, semester, this year, last semester, Susanna talked a lot about healing spaces and architecture and how the physical environment uh, affects people's health and well-being. And personal research of mine through a book that Claire Cooper Marcus wrote is that people carry an inherent connection to their built environment, good or bad. And so home for everybody is different. Like what I enjoy in my spaces may be different than what anybody in this room might enjoy. And so really what it boiled down to for me was that the needs of one person are never really going to match up with the needs of another. Um, that idea prompted me to look into open building, which is a concept established by John Hobrocken. And it looks at um, adaptable spaces in residential architecture. It's a concept that we know well today and exists actually in the commercial realm. But um, as far as residences are concerned, it really hasn't been lifted off the ground. Um, but Hot Rockin establishes this idea that you need to disentangle the parts of your building. So various aspects act independently but cohesively as one whole. The structure of your building is separate from the mechanics of your building. And so this diagram kind of shows that various parts of a building, whether it's the infill and supporting walls or it's the structure, have different lifespans. And we as architects and designers need to recognize that. Um, Stephen Kendall, who has also done a considerable amount of research on Hot Rockin's um, concept, furthers this idea and starts to look at the different levels of control that exist in our environments. So that is to say that the city structure, one of our larger um, elements, is more longer lasting and more permanent than the infill level of a building. And this diagram illustrates it really well that as you go down to smaller and smaller details, the lifespan of these things is um, shorter and shorter, as well as the number of users involved in the process. 
But one of the most critical aspects of open building is that it's user-centered design. And so Habrakan really highlights the fact that the user, the inhabitant of the space, is the decision-making agent, that they get to make decisions based on what they want. And so in an intergenerational community, I think this is critical. And this diagram really illustrates the whole notion behind getting to choose your space and what you like in it. And so um, one of the case studies I have looked at in Switzerland illustrates this really well. Um, in this plan, before outfitted individually, there's kind of a central core where all of your utilitarian functions exist, those things that can't move, toilets, sinks, and kitchens. And then it leaves a really open plan within the unit for people to plan as they want and change over time and can change with them. So, um, and this project does a really great job of illustrating those different levels of control. The structure of the building, which is concrete, is there's a continuity in the space just in the way that the walls have been framed out. There's transom windows above all of the doors, and so there's this really nice play between what is more permanent and what is less permanent. And it gives the user the opportunity to choose what they need. This is one of the case studies that Susanna had our class look at. It's actually Sarah Hartman. And um, it is looking at a regularized pattern in a building um, with cores, again, of utilitarian functions. But what's great about this is this one individual unit right here at the bottom of the screen just looks at the lifespan of a family. And one of the issues that intergenerational living needs to address is aging in place. And baby boomers want nothing more than to age in place if we can make that possible, I think, is the best kind of design. And so in this, you have, at the beginning, just an open plan apartment for a couple. And as there's the addition of family and um, children, you need spaces like additional bedrooms and playrooms. And so some of those can become closed off, as in this one. There's a playroom down here where it used to be just living space. And then as they grow and leave, your space can change. And in the end, they might have a necessity for a bedroom to, say, bring a parent in. Um, that they need to take care of. And so the space adapts for them. And so really, uh, Stephen Kendall put this the best way, is how do we design the built environment to support both stability in respect to long-term community interests and change in respect to individual preferences? And so intergenerationally speaking, how do we look at aging in place? How, how do we design for aging in place? And how can we design a sense of community where people still retain a certain amount of individuality and choice. And so that is my focus. I'll pass the torch to Dana. I'm Dana Williamson, and I'm looking at how color and light can provide a, a create a healing space in these intergenerational living communities. We, my research has uh, led me to find that color and light really has been studied a lot for its positive health effects, including um, reducing a risk of depression. And they found that in dark, colorless working environments and living environments, people <laughs> tend to be depressed more. Um, and then they've also found that the correct amounts and applications of light can improve your mobility within a building, uh, which is really helpful for uh, people as we age. You know, our, we need more and more uh, light. And so this helps in decreasing the risk of uh, tripping and like injuries. I've also found that color can improve wayfinding, which is the navigation um, and remembering of locations within a building. Um, so that's really interesting that, you know, warm colors and cool colors, they have a different effect on people and can really help you in finding your way through a building. They've found that artificial light, uh, specifically low level, uh, low light, low level light therapy, excuse me, also has many health benefits. Um, including reduction of pain, inflammation and swelling, um, and healing of wounds and prevention of tissue damage. Um, and we all know that daylight also has a healing effect. Um, when we don't get enough of it, we might become depressed, and it's known as a seasonal affective disorder. And since we're looking at Seattle, it's an overcast climate, um, they tend to be affected by that quite a bit. So I was looking at ways to combat that in my specific project, and um, I chose a community center that will use light to combat seasonal affective disorder and um, both natural and artificial as in 
this and then light combined with water. So uh, providing a place for physical and emotional and spiritual healing. My research led me to come up with a list of design guidelines based on color and light, just like we did for our studio. The first one is um, a narrow plan, which allows light to reach into uh, the interior spaces of the building because your floor plan, your floor plate is so narrow that there, all the spaces within the building will have access to light, which is also related to daylighting from two, from two sides. If you have a narrow plan, it's really easy, just like in that classroom and then light reaches all the way in. and So you don't have dark spaces in the interior of the building. Light from above and or below. I think we're all familiar with skylights, so light from above. But just uh, trying to design it in such a way that the quality of light is beneficial and, and creates interest so that people want to be in these spaces. Transparency through the building. Um, many of you have probably been to the Nelson Atkins Museum and just being able to see through the building to different spaces really creates a sense of connectedness without having to actually be around anybody. You can still be in the comfort of your own space, but feel connected to other people within the building and outside the building. Um, I also want to use light shelves. Uh, the, a big thing with too much daylight is glare. And as we get older, we, um, our eyes can't handle glare as, you know, as well as we might have. And so light shelves are a big way to block that daylight and be able to diffuse it up into the room where it can fill the interior without causing a lot of glare. And it really works with the seasons, so it's an effective tool to use. Also want to use a light washing a wall. Just something that really can make something special and draw your eye and maybe help you lead, um, help lead you through the building. Just create specific interest. Also a hidden light source. This keeps maybe not as well designed light fixtures from being seen, so you can still keep this really mysterious or special quality. And it also keeps the um, light sources in the same area so that at night you're still getting light from that same spot, so it keeps people um, in the, you know, orientated within the building. Floor to ceiling windows let in the maximum amount of light, which is what we want in Seattle, but combined with these other design guidelines that I'm, I'm looking at, we can um, control that sunlight. So combined with the exterior operable shading, you add some architectural features, but the user is really in control of how much sunlight they get in their space. And then a double height space takes all of these and and brings them together in such a way that people can live and be in control of their space and get the proper amount of daylight in their living environments. And then I will pass it on to Adam. My name is Adam Freilich, and I am looking at physical activity and how that plays in intergenerational living. Um, physical activity can be put up into one of four different types of exercises you have. You have balance, which, you know, exercises that can be put into that are forms like Tai Chi. And those are, be, are really important, especially for older populations where there's a greater risk to falling and there's much greater consequences if they do fall. And doing balance exercises such as that can help them avoid such a scenario. Next are flexibility. And yoga really plays well into that. And cardio endurance. And that's something that every single person does every single day. And that's be as simple as walking down a hallway, going up a flight of stairs, even while you're dancing. You're having fun and it's still doing exercise. And the last, of course, is probably what many of us are, what we first think of, is strength training. And that's doing weights and dumbbells and, and bands. And all of these different forms of exercises are all crucial and essential for overall health and well-being. And the best way to be healthy is to be active and to be active for life. There is an example of a 90-year-old woman who uh, has been active her entire life. She particularly has done yoga her entire life, and she's still living at home, still cooking her own meals, even has a driver's license, and still living a normal, everyday life, while other individuals her own age are stuck in assisted care. And the reason why she's not in that situation is because she chose to be active and active for her entire life. 
So what are the results of being active, of course, are the effects on the human body. You, of course, you improve, you keep your weight under control, increase your energy levels, but it's more than just affecting your body. It's also affecting your mind. Um, studies have been shown that individuals who are physically active, they are happier as well as healthier. And the reason for that is when you exercise, your body releases a chemical called a happy chemical, if you will, and it literally makes you happy. And these individuals are less prone to depression and other psychological and mental disorders. So overall, by making activity part of your life, it's improving you as a whole. And so with so many great things that, have, that happen with physical activity, one would think that everyone would take part. Well, unfortunately, that's not the case. Uh, you can see on the chart to the right, 69% of adults and 43% of school children are overweight or morbidly obese. And the reason why this is a major problem is because obesity is second only to tobacco as the number one cause of premature death in the United States. And why is this? Is lack of physical activity. And why are people being so physically inactive? Much of our built world does not encourage people to be active. It encourages sedentary behavior. Instead of being able to walk to the gym, you have to get into a car and drive there. Another part of, it, of that is that many people don't want to exercise. It's a chore. Even some of the best athletes out there still say it's a struggle to get up and, and do it every single day. So in terms of an intergenerational project, because it obviously affects men and women, children and the elderly, um, what does this mean to bring this into a model? It does it, to me, it doesn't mean making another fitness center. We have that, and obviously it's not working. So is there a way of bringing strategies into a building form that make people more active and healthier without them even realizing it? Currently, with my own design scheme, with a picture onto the right, I'm looking at two towers that are significantly, significantly taller than the surrounding context and kind of overlapping with some of my own classmates' projects, uh, more specifically with Dana's currently. The reason for I'm making two taller towers is to bring in more sunlight and better views and access to nature. Um, spaces that actually have all of these three components, they're more likely to be used for activity. People are going to move more within them. And what happens to the space in between? It's not enough just to make the, the building do one thing and the exterior another. What happens in between is crucial, especially because it's going to be one cohesive piece. I'm looking at a project done in New York City, the High Line. Um, pretty much that is an elevated railroad road, uh, line that's recently been converted to a, uh, a park filled with pathways and shrubs and flowers. And it's more than just a park. It's another way of experiencing the city, providing views and experiences that you wouldn't have on the ground level. And it's a way of getting away from the concrete jungle. Well, you can take that vocabulary, and why can you not put that into a building form in between so that if you are, that is your home, you're able to escape from the, this concrete world. And, it's, and because it's within your building, it's private, it's more intimate, and you're comfortable with letting your children go out there and be active in a urban setting, or if you want to go out there and read a book. A second strategy is separating building elements. Yes, because I'm looking at physical activity, I will be putting, of course, fit, a fitness center. But uh, to me, a problem with so the fitness centers we have is that they're really large complexes. It's just row after row of machinery. And really, it's, that can be really intimidating for some individuals. Why not break that up down so that people really love and enjoy being in them and putting them in different parts of a building so that each one is unique, has different views, different forms of lighting, and the greatest benefit of separating these elements and all the crucial parts of a building is that there's going to be more activity in between. You have to walk more. Just simply taking a few more steps every day can have outstanding impacts on your overall health. And when it comes to circulation, especially vertical circulations like staircases, um, they don't have to be something ugly. You want to, if you, the more beautiful you make something, the more likely people are going to want to use it. And take the elevators, and yes, we have to have them, but make them so that they are slower, or that the only individuals who must use them are the ones who can use them. 
and you can make the Syracuse as something grand. And it's not just taking people from point A to point B. Let that be a moment where they think of a wonderful memory or they envision something else happening, but they enjoy being with Attractive spaces where people want to be in. And this is just an example of a home gym that, um, it, that just proves that it does not have to be the traditional concrete setting that we see everywhere. You can have access to views and natural lighting and materials that you enjoy and it's yours and you're proud of it and, and the end result is just be over healthier, stronger, and happier. Um, I'm focused on food. Uh, growing, preparing, and consuming are three aspects of food that can contribute to the quality of life for people of all ages. Uh, this is an intergenerational need, um, health itself, and just it's perfect to go right after Adam, who also agrees with this. Um, three aspects of health uh, that all people need are social, nutritional, and physical. Um, isolation is a health factor for everyone. Um, social engagement uh, is a necessity to all people to keep them feeling healthy. Uh, Nutrition, poor diet, and physical activity, as Autumn said, the number of people overweight in this country. Um, and, um, and that goes along with physical activity. Uh, so why food? Um, food surrounds us. It's one of those um, everyone has to eat every day. And um, obviously it's a repeated, a repeated occurrence, and it's uh, ingrained in our culture. And um, through these, uh, these three aspects can be improved, of health can be improved with food, the social, nutritional, and physical. Um, uh, by growing food, uh, there are opportunities for these three uh, elements to be improved. Uh, nutritionally, learning about nutrition, where the food comes from, um, and how it's grown and socially people getting together to um, to act in this activity and it's a physical activity uh, growing and planting uh, preparing food uh, socially people coming together learning together sharing learning about nutrition and where again the food that you've raised can be used and how you prepare it and healthful um, Tasting. I mean, that sometimes fruits and vegetables aren't necessarily things that people want to eat, but how to make them so that people want to eat them. Um, and physically, it's a physical activity. You know, for an aging environment or a group of aging adults, this could be a very um, simple, in some ways, activity that everyone can participate in. Um, and sharing, bringing people together, um, families eating together, it creates this social arrangement for people to. Um, share stories or sharing what they've learned about nutrition and uh, a way to build a community. Um, and this concept, this is Alice Waters. Uh, she's in, um, from Berkeley, California, and uh, she's leading a food revolution um, about uh, growing food locally and sustainably and um, learning or teaching others about the importance of nutrition. Uh, and her, one of her major organizations that she's created is within schools. Uh, and it's, her project is called The Edible Schoolyard. And she creates um, a part of the curriculum for students. Uh, part of their every single day activity is to grow or participate in gardening. And this, the food that was from the garden is then prepared and they share it and make it together, and it's this whole experience that's ingrained in their um, everyday life. Um, and I thought this uh, could be related into a concept that could potentially be uh, uh, transferred to a building to grow, prepare, and share. Uh, and this quote embodies what I would like my building uh, to do for others, and that's Experiences in the kitchen and garden foster a better understanding of how the natural world sustains us and promotes the environmental and social well-being of our community. And originally that said our school community, but why couldn't it be our aging intergenerational community? And lastly, this is how I propose uh, 
um, I'm currently working on, we still have this semester, but um, to take this concept and run with it, how to grow potentially a rooftop farm where the people living within the building and the community could come and garden together. Um, and the rest, or the kitchen, where they can prepare, and there's some interactive uh, learning kitchen, um, and a restaurant where that food is shared together. <coughs> Hi, I am Jordan Albers. Uh, and I'm Devin Murphy, and we are sharing the topic of outdoor space and how it can be integrated into this urban intergenerational living at various levels throughout these projects. Um, so we both, we're, we are doing individual projects, but we both looked at um, a lot of uh, research talking about how nature is healing and how people need outdoor spaces um, and how they're really important and we've looked at it um, for children and adults and then everybody every one in between um, and Robin see more uh, particularly for children and how it's important for them because they live through their senses and um, experience through play really develops their self-confidence and who they are and um, it's really healthy for kids to have good play experiences and the outdoors can bring a lot to that. Um, and then Roger Ulrich, Ulrich and Susan Rodick <coughs> talk a lot about um, outdoor spaces for the elderly and that they really desire them, but the primary concern with uh, the elderly and outdoor spaces is the safety issue and that we need to design <coughs> spaces that elderly feel safe in. Um, and just that it's really important. Um, uh, and Claire Cooper Marcus, who Ian had mentioned earlier, has also really looked into the aspect of the social interaction that occurs in outdoor space within these living community environments and how it really is beneficial to both the younger generations and the older population and just the overall aspect of their health and social health. So um, from all the research that we've done, we've both developed uh, design guidelines that talk about what we need to do in designing the outdoor spaces for the young and the old, and for um, children. It's particularly um, important to have different types of play spaces, uh, such as gardening, sandboxes, sound making, and quiet play. Um, and then design considerations with that, um, things like having it adjacent to toilets and childproof <coughs> exits and a variety of play surfaces for um, different weather conditions. And then they also talk about using real life materials such as um, a garden hose for putting out a fire or things like that that make a more dramatic play experience for children that in the more recent years people have been more concerned about child safety and don't let them touch this because it could be sharp or something like that. Um, but the, it kind of takes away from the experiences that the children are having when they're playing. Um, and then this is an example um, that Alan Dunlop did in a school where he, it shows a different variety of um, child equipment that is designed that doesn't have to look like the big orange, yellow, and blue, and red, chunky um, plastic things, that it can be an actual visual um, appealing thing. Um, and as we've seen specifically in Adam's research, physical activity is really key to everyone's health. So outdoor space plays into that very well, and especially for elders. Um, providing seating and activi activity areas long and close to circulation paths that they use every day is really key to encouraging both physical activity and just the use of outdoor space in general. And also providing views into their surrounding context, into the neighborhood, not just focusing everything inward. You need to connect with the community around you to provide that sense of social interaction and community and also providing ways to customize a space. So by providing seating that you can move around along with fixed seating that's in the design uh, is a really necessary aspect. So we'll just show you uh, both where we're at in our work and how we're interpreting this into our building designs. Um, my building design that I am moving forward with is on the left, as you can see, a study model, and it's about having two um, independent living towers that are connected by an outdoor space and it's really about how the outdoor space can be a place that brings people of multiple generations together. Um, and then this is a case study that we visited in Seattle that I think is really, um, it has a rich quality about it where there's different leveled terraces of outdoor space 
So it's not just one big thing. It can be comfortable on a lot of different scales. Okay. Um, my project is really focusing on kind of the meshing of interior and exterior spaces. So here in this party diagram, you have a bar of interior living spaces next to a bar of outdoor space, which I'm really focusing on integrating circulation within the outdoors. So I have these two precedents, both from Switzerland. One is of a kind of new, new form of urban vertical park where it's all enclosed within the structure and you move vertically through this green space. And then also in this uh, housing project, the, it incorporates the same sort of structure only as its main circulation space, but it also houses uh, social spaces directly adjacent to the living spaces that can be used by everyone who shares a community. <laughs> Hello, my name is Landon Hubbard. Um, I'll be wrapping this up. <laughs> so. Uh, my emphasis for this project as it pertains to intergenerational living is to really create a mixed-use building that is tailored to a certain group of individuals. And the individuals I'm looking at is what I'm categorizing as makers, and that can be anything from um, craftspeople, artisans, tradespeople, retirees, students, um, artists, musicians. It can really be anything that is uh, in the creative realm. And this is uh, just a simple sketch of the idea for the building is that living and making will be integrated um, together so that um, I'll keep going. Really there's two questions that I'm trying to answer with this. So can this act of making um, across generations promote a healthy living environment and if it can, how can the architecture speak to that? So my research, what I've been looking at is intergenerational service learning programs, and it's um, basically a mentorship program of two uh, different generations. And the one I'm uh, showing you here today is uh, college-age students with older adult adults, and there's really positive outcomes from all of these um, programs. And then this one in particular, the college-age students before they went into this um, were sort of put off by working with elderly individuals, but at the end of this, they had more knowledge about the elderly generation and they fostered lasting relationships that lasted well beyond the service program. And supplementing that, I'm also reading a book called Shop Classes Soulcraft and it's an inquiry into the value of work. And it's basically just an informative text about working with one's hands and being um, connected with uh, the objects that we produce. <coughs> And I think in today's society, people are becoming more frugal and they want things to be brought closer to home, whether that's growing their own food or making their own furniture or even their own clothing. So I think that's an important um, aspect of what this building has to offer. A couple of case studies. Uh, I actually visited this when we were up in the Northwest. This is ADX in Portland and it's a shop, a workshop where you uh, purchase a membership and you can go use the facilities here. And I want to integrate this into my building so that um, multiple generations within the city can come use this, even though it is a housing development, that that knowledge transferred across generations can happen with anyone in the city, not just exclusive to the people that are living there. And another um, case study, this isn't, an, well, this isn't an intergenerational um, project, but it, um, it has some things that I'm looking at doing for uh, studio spaces. So in the floor plan here, this was designed as an open plan and this is just the architect's um, iteration of what could happen here. And this is all living towards the front and a studio in the back. And you could imagine a place where someone like an artist might use their studio to paint, but as, the, as they would age, if they needed a care, caretaker to move in with them, walls could be added in the studio and they could live there with them. Um, and that is all for us, thank you for coming. I think we're opening it up to questions. Yes. Yeah, I mean. Thank you. Um, three things I think you might want to consider that I see that may have been left out. But maybe if you've got them, maybe you just didn't talk about it. One is sound. Um, did y'all have anything with music <laughs> or any other thing um, like that? 
My focus is silent architecture. It's not really sound silent. It's more of a calming, peaceful type of a space. But well, it would these are urban areas, and there's going to be a lot of traffic outside. Right. So it would accommodate, you know, some sort of soundproofing and trying to quiet uh, the space. You know, sound could be positive, and sound can be negative. Right. And um, there are architectural ways now, and I'm not an architect. Uh, but I know engineers have come up with a way of white noising things out that might be considered in any kind of, I mean, I'm old and I, I don't like loud noises that much. And um, so it's, it, it might be a feature that you could build in in terms of sight, but the color and sound out of, and uh, light is a part of it, but, it, but I would say it's color, light, and sound. And, and that can be a leading aspect aspect of, of helping people get through that. Um, the other one I, I didn't see very much of, but I'm sure you must have it in there, is that people my age and older don't really have a facility for social media that you guys do. And I wonder if that's something I, I, was, I thought you were going to get at it when you were talking about learning. You know, with a lower, a, a, a younger generation teaching an older generation how to do that. My wife and I just got back from a, a, a trip on a, on a boat, and I noticed that the classes they had were populated with all the old folks trying to learn how to use a computer and stuff like that. Um, and the last thing, which is the most important thing that you left out, is you didn't have a bar in there. <laughs> Dude. All folks have got to have a bar. <laughs> well, we have taken that down now. <laughs> Good point. Yes. With all the work you're doing, have you considered the development of a concept to put in place, say, on campus or in relation to the campus in Manhattan, putting these concepts together? Like one of you talked about the student thing in relation to seniors, and there's some retirement facilities in Manhattan as there are here in Lawrence. Have, have you considered working with uh, some of the retire, retirement communities and other parts of the university to put together a concept there on the, onto or related to the campus? Well, we haven't done that yet. Um, I know that uh, the former CEO of the Meadowlark Hills retirement community in Manhattan has looked at the downtown area of Manhattan to see if an outrigger could be built there. And I think um, that the city certainly realizes that it would be a very attractive place for people to age. Uh, actually, Manhattan prides itself and advertises itself as a retirement community. But uh, this person could not work it out financially, so it hasn't happened. Um, I think there's a lot of potential for that, particularly as more and more boomers come of age and would like to live, uh, get out of their single family residences and mowing the lawn and being responsible for a lot of square footage that they don't really need anymore, but not leave the city. And Manhattan is small enough to, you know, moving a block down or several blocks would not move them out of their social um, relationships and. I think it would work really well. I, I would love it personally. Yeah, well, so. As a follow-up, do, do you know of any of the corporate uh, chains of these retirement centers that have an interest in this kind of? I I don't, but maybe Dennis does. Well, they may have an interest um, because they, there's a huge demand, um, but a complicated future, and I think that uh, some of your work today and. Some of the work that was exhibited in Marvin Hall suggests new forms that might um, uh, interest developers. There's used to be a developer here with us. Maybe there are others uh, who are looking for ways to make it both um, attractive to many generations and also financeable. That's the big issue: is how do you finance these things? Wonderful ideas presented. The question is. Can you really build vertical uh, uh, gardens? Uh, and can you do gardens on roofs, which are going to cost you a great deal because of the structural necessities to have them? So 
these ideas are fantastic. The question is, can you finance them? And well, that's a constant problem. I think a big part of the studio is that we're coming up with these like design guidelines that we talked about, so that this can be translated to a project mm -hmm. that can be anywhere, you know, and not just ones that we've come up with. Mm -hmm. So we're trying to make it more accessible for other architects to take it <coughs> and use it, yeah. so that developers can try yeah. to make it financeable. Yeah. Yes, many of us are considering, and it's not a something that we have a lot of experience with because we're not in the working world yet. We're not paying bills, but no. But in terms, we are looking at case studies. That's the best way we have, I think, to I mean, that rooftop garden. There are numerous case studies in Brooklyn where they've taken old warehouses and converted old structures to be able to. Um, they're maintained through a different corporation, so maybe it's run by farmers and they have their business on the roof. And there's different ways to, to sell the idea as best we can. I think also a lot of us here are looking at the context of where, of where we're building our projects. It's in Seattle, Washington, you know, building with lots of glass and rooftop gardens. Actually, you won't have to do anything to a rooftop garden in Seattle. They get so much moisture and things like that. But you couldn't do that here, let's say, in Southwest Kansas. So it just it really builds up a whole lot on to context. But some of the things that we have all mentioned can't be translated, used in their own way. Yeah, in Seattle, it's more likely you're going to have to worry about how much water comes down and how much weight is stressing the building. So there are all these ways that you can apply them. I was really interested in the the last. What's your name? Landon. Landon. Because you took a concept that looked at a kind of thematic way to bring people together from lots of generations who kind of have natural interests in that, the makers of the world, right? There are probably makers here who could be working under the car or just building your own furniture or could be just knocking around doing some kind of home repair work could be a kid getting a home repair merit badge or something like that, right? Uh, because I remember doing that with my grandfather and dad. So, I mean, I think that the maker idea has come up a number of times in our discussions and even in the intergenerational community we're thinking about here, a maker space. People have brought that up more than once. It seems to me that maybe if they just had some kind of building design for lots of different people. And I think the maker idea is a good example. I kept struggling to look at, you know, sure, a lot of the issues that you're bringing up uh, are important to all people, but how could you bring people together across generations? Because the first thing they have to do is to get used to each other. One of you said initially they didn't like each other very much, and then at the end they had long extended relationships. I think that's really the kind of thing that um, has to be emphasized that people coming together actually find a lot more in common. For example, around making. Maybe, I don't know if you would extend this too far, but so I begin to think, okay, art's one of them, music is one of them, making is one of them. What are those other themes that bring people together kind of naturally across generations because we all enjoy them and maybe you ought to accentuate those kinds of activities that break down these barriers. So I like the maker idea because I've heard that <laughs> often and I can see people coming together yeah. doing stuff like this guy right here, right? <laughs> You'd be in there all the time. Yeah. Something maybe I should have touched on was a more broader spectrum of the fact that it's just a shared interest group, whether it's physical activity or gardening. Yeah, it well, allows you did you to gardening, for on, example. Yeah, on There's a common ground. There's a good example of one. Would bridge that generational gap. So. Yeah. So I don't know if you could begin to organize buildings around themes or whether that would make sense to people in gerontology in this room and know better. But it seems to me that there are some natural, I call them elective affinities, because Goethe wrote a book on <coughs> Die Wahlverwandtschaft. Not too many people have read that, but it, the elective affinities. And I think that we do elect connectivities. And maybe we should take more advantage of that. I'd like for someone to critique that as an idea, maybe in this room, but I could get gardening. I could get uh, making. Uh, I kept searching for ways, well, why should people come together? 
and uh, the playground, for example. I think that older people who maybe are not going to use those slippery slides would like to, some people call them perches, to watch from a certain distance. You kind of suggested that. I think there's several students who are looking at that. We didn't get into everything. No, no, of course you didn't. That uh, is going on, but I think this notion of um, combining spaces for older populations and families with young children, children is, I think, potentially very beneficial uh, for watching, for potential helping out with watching kids when the parents are busy, or I don't know. There. No, there are some of those um, settings that I'm familiar with in Denmark, where literally, uh, I think in nursing homes or I don't know, that they're combined with a kindergarten or a preschool. And yes, they're not operated by older populations necessarily, but they can overlook and they can share and the kids can go over and sing a song and the older people can go over and read a story. So there is a lot of uh, potential for to meet, to get to know each other, to support each other, I think, to learn from each other. Well, one of the things, one of the things to bring people together is a bar. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I was just wondering, are any of you in landscape architecture as well? No. No. Do you all not talk to the landscape architecture? Yeah, do. But not often. He's a geographer, so you need to be careful. <laughs> well, I was just thinking that, uh, Part of a, a learning experience might be to look at Japanese culture where they really create an art form in terms of taking a very small space and making it appear as if it were nature. And, and downsizing to, to accommodate um, you know, a, a living space and so forth, that might be something that would be factored in in terms of the landscape aesthetics. Well, that's a question both for the landscape as well as for interior spaces. And it's a question that I have, certainly, because some of the examples, uh, maybe all of the examples that we looked at as precedent study come out of Europe, where the, um, the, the amount of space that people think they need tends to be less than what people, at least in the West, think they need to be happy. And that's sort of a question, perhaps, to you as you think about aging, whether you could imagine to reduce your square footage and to make do with less space or, or not. I mean, this is one of the questions that arose in the studio. How relevant are precedent studies from Europe? How applicable might they be in this country? Because it's obviously there are different expectations, different cultures. So I think that, that would be a question that perhaps you could help us with. If you're going to look at Seattle, you know, one place you ought to go look is on the waterfront because they have floating homes. And there's an example of where compactness and, you know, close living has to accommodate a, a lot of other things. Uh, and you might learn something from that in terms of, and another place, of course, is uh, Sausalito in San Francisco, uh, two of my favorite places. Uh, and, uh, well, before I came here, I lived on a 75 foot stern wheel paddle wheel boat. We only had 600 square feet in the whole place. But it was my wife and three cats, so we were happy. Now I live in a 3,000 square foot house. I can't find anything in the house. I find the cats. <laughs> You're not happy there. <laughs> Oh, yeah, man. <laughs> <laughs> there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> As you've been programming your buildings and your sites, how have you thought about circulation and mobility and the whole range of how people move, both as a pedestrian or if they're physically challenged, if they have their own car, or if they're using transit? How did you think about those issues? I think a lot of us in our building designs right now are addressing circulation in a sort of dynamic and um, social way. And of course we have the required ADA and um, other aspects incorporated into the buildings, but like in my case particularly, my social spaces are the circulation spaces. 
and those circulation spaces start to bridge outside of the site, um, there's an opportunity for not just the users of the building to access, but it brings in additional people. Uh, I know I'm not the only person thinking that way. But um, as far as orienting towards the existing um, urban fabric, a lot of us in programming last semester looked at the existing conditions and have geared like the way people approach our building in the same way that the existing structures around us do. Um, whether it be commercial placement, um, where our main entries are in the building in relation to public transportation and that sort of thing. And beyond that, a lot of us are incorporating like parking into our building and providing parking, whether it's um, a vehicle or bicycle parking or things like that, just giving people the option of what they'd like to do um, and understanding that they may not walk everywhere to a public transit, that some people like their car and providing for that. Um, yeah. So it's a wide range of scales. I, I'm glad to hear about parking in cars because it, it, it intergenerational, I mean, if you're talking about people with children, um, both people are likely to be working. So you have 16 units, that means you need parking for 32 cars. And, and um, older people don't give up their cars. They, this is a very important um, feature as well. And I can tell you from interviewing people in retirement communities, they absolutely do not like walking more than a few steps to their car. As much as you want them to go around and walk, they want that car parked right outside the door as it has been their entire lives. That's less of a problem, but um, the, you're, it needs a lot of space, parking. It's an inconvenient thing about Americans, but we need to have those big pieces of metal near us at all times. I don't think, well, I don't know, I can't, I guess I can't speak for everyone, but I don't know that everyone's going to require the full two cars per unit, but we are thinking about parking, and Seattle has um, an interesting system, it's the go car, where you can go and check out a car for a while if you need to go get groceries or run errands that are farther away, um, and I think we are thinking about maybe in 30 years people not may not be as dependent on their car, but right now, like, we do need parking, and that's not going to totally go away. And also looking at some of what Seattle is doing. Seattle is actually having a program that started in 2008. It's pretty much just taking back the roads and giving them back to the pedestrian, where the roads are no longer available for the cars to use, and they're only used for pedestrians. And so <coughs> what does that mean? There are fewer and fewer parking spots. And so, and when you live in an urban context, there's really not so much of a need to have a car. When you have public transportation, and if you absolutely need one, like Jordan said, they have those vehicles that you can rent. Maybe you just need a motor pool. <laughs> just put cars there and you check it out with your credit card. Mm -hmm. that's, that's a go card kind of mm -hmm. system. Yeah. I think another um, interesting idea that Susie Stadler talked about when she gave her presentation was about bringing the world in. And we all have um, our different ideas of how we're going to do that. Um, for example, I have like a deli and a restaurant in my basement that, or not my basement, on the ground floor <laughs> <laughs> on Occidental Ave that um, provides for a daycare that I have for children and then there's an also like an adult hangout area where um, elder adults who aren't working could go during the day and play cards with oh, their friends oh <laughs> <laughs> and um, watch over the younger kids. So we all have our own different ideas about bringing them in since the elderly about how their world shrinks and they don't like to go out as far um, as they age. So that's yeah. Yeah. Um, I was uh, in Florida, uh, in Naples, uh, a couple of weeks ago. And um, this is in reference to uh, what's happening in Europe in terms of the smaller living units and bigger spaces for uh, uh, everyone to use. Um, that message hasn't gotten to Florida. There are developers, I, I, I went to a number of different developments, uh, self-contained developments for el the elderly over 55, uh, 4,000 units and 4,000 other units in two different locations, totally isolated from anything, totally isolated. You have to, uh, I timed it, I had to, tr oh, drive a car for 12 minutes just to get to the main road. And then I had to drive another 10 minutes to get 
to the grocery store. So I, I, there's a disconnect here the, between the developers and the aging population and their needs. Yeah, and uh, you know, I'm, I'm aware of some of these developments and I think one reason why I put the word sustainable into the title for the studio has to do with this approach to doing things because I don't think that it has a future. I mean, we, we just can't live like that, whether it's for retirement communities or in any way. We, we can't develop our cities like that. And so, I mean, we are probably in this class taking perhaps the other extreme case, just in contrast. Uh, and maybe we're not meeting the current expectations of, of people that could very well be. But uh, to, I take that as a risk and perhaps as a learning uh, opportunity for the students to just look at the other extreme. So we're aware of it and we know that in other countries, other cultures, it's possible to maybe find, when, as these students go out into the real world and are possibly faced with tasks like this, to say, well, okay, so that was one thing, we don't want this, so what, what is a good way of doing it? So that's where I'm coming from in terms of um, taking this particular approach to teaching the studio. But we have to get older populations into city centers. We have to get everybody back into city centers. So, you had a question? I'm just curious, uh, have you ever measured some outcome after you implementing your design? Because your idea sounds really healthy and good, but I don't know it is really actually beneficial in the health. Well, we haven't done that just uh, because we're not building anything. We're just considering. But uh, we are using the um, results of studies that have measured in certain areas, such as Susan Rodig studying uh, gardens for older populations and finding certain things. And then we're saying, well, she did a good job. So we're, we're taking her insights and trying then to say, well, what might that look like? on this side in Seattle. So we are not measuring, we're not doing actual research. We are just using other people's research to some degree uh, and translating that back into architecture, landscape architecture to some degree, space making. That's where we see our task. Well, obviously we're getting close to an end, but the problem I always see is the application of the European model, which is a normally, I mean, European um, housing is mostly urban. It, it could be out there in suburbia, but it's a, there are big buildings like you're suggesting. And we have built unsustainable um, urban design in this country because we do these sprawling suburbs. And what I worry about is that we're in this sort of transition in which we're not going to get out of the cultural demand for a sprawling suburb or a change in the suburb or the community that we might want to build in Lawrence. The first group of uh, units are uh, townhouses, single family houses that fit some requirements, for example, uh, universal design and visitability. Uh, exterior design, but it seems to me that one of our great problems is going to be is to take your kind of work and if we move it outside of Seattle, New York, uh, Chicago, we get into the suburban nation and most people in the United States live in suburbia now. So that's a big challenge for us and um, you're looking at urban housing I think and that's very, very important because lots of people live in the big cities. Out here, we're looking at miles and miles and miles of what I consider to be a wasteland, but that's where Americans have put their money. And so the question how we can transform new communities that are kind of in between. Because one day, they won't probably be driving all over the place, David. Maybe not. Uh, maybe they will be. Uh, but there is some suggestion that we might be driving less. I believe that. Well, I couldn't get two of my grandchildren are in their 20s and they still don't drive, which I think is fantastic because I was driving at 13 or 12, right? So, so I mean, I think there are futures 
that are going to happen here that we haven't understood or imagined. But you're imagining futures that help us move in that direction. And so that's really important. I think this will uh, be on our, uh, you're going to have one more question. This will be on our um, website, and I hope that we can get people to return to it for the main core ideas that you have. How do we apply them? That's your struggle this semester. It's our struggle for the next decade, I think. And so you as architects out there working, you will be ready to work on this when you graduate with the degrees that you are um, pursuing. And I think that's fantastic. Lee, one last question. I, I just have a comment. And I, I just want to say you guys are what I think are probably on the right track. And you are seeing a lot of the struggles that developers have here because being in this business everybody's done the same thing for the last hundred years nobody wants to change it the thing they're not willing to do which we've been willing to do most of the core group in here uh, a lot of us are here at the start of the studio is that we have to train retrain <coughs> the existing architecture the existing contractors the existing developers because Everybody's got a set of blinders on, and nobody wants to change the system. And the bank. That's and the bank. They particularly don't want to change it. The main problem. So, if we're going to change it and we're going to guide the horse, we all have to set the target, re-educate, and and people will change, but it takes time. And we've been associated with a lot of the other developers that are out there, and nobody wants to change. But we do. We're one that does, and there's several that, that do want to change. But stay on the right track. All of you guys have made a great presentation. Appreciate it. Learned a lot. Thanks, everyone, for coming on a great day.